Dean Correll, known as the Candyman, was born on December 24, 1939, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He had a tough childhood, feeling lonely and caught in fights between his parents who eventually got divorced. Correll worked in the family candy business for years, and it's where he came to terms with being gay. However, his personal life turned darker over time. Between 1970 and 1973, he killed at least 28 people, though some believe the actual number could be higher. It is possible that all the bodies could not be found. But according to the available evidence, all of his victims were males aged 13 to 20, the majority of them in their mid-teens. Most of the victims were abducted from Houston Heights, which was then a low-income neighborhood northwest of downtown Houston. With most abductions, he was assisted by one or both of his teenage accomplices, David Owen Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley. Several victims were friends of one or both of Coral's accomplices. Others were individuals with whom Coral had himself become acquainted to prior to their abduction and murder. And two other victims, Billy Balch and Gregory Mallywinkle, were former employees of the Coral Candy Company. Coral's victims were usually lured into either one of the two vehicles that he owned or a 1969 Chevrolet Corvette that he is known to have purchased. The enticement was usually an offer of a party or a lift, and the victim would be driven to Coral's house. Once there, the youth would be given alcohol or other drugs until they passed out, tricked into donning handcuffs or simply grabbed by force. They were then stripped naked and tied to either Coral's bed or usually a plywood torture board which was regularly hung on a wall. Once manacled, the victims would be sexually assaulted, beaten, tortured and sometimes after several days killed by strangulation or shooting with a .22 caliber pistol. Their bodies were then tied in plastic sheeting and buried in discreet locations nearby. In several instances, Coral forced his victims to either phone or write to their parents with explanations for their absence in an effort to soothe any of the parents' fears for their son's safety. He is also known to have retained keepsakes, usually keys, from his victims. He was often referred to as the Candyman or the Pied Piper, due to his connection to his family firm, the Coral Candy Company. He was said to have a habit of handing out free candy to kids. And later on, this turned out to be horrifyingly similar to his habit of enticing young men with special treats to trust him, right up to the point where they were captured, tortured, and murdered by the candy man. Dean Coral died in 1973 after a violent dispute and shooting incident after bleeding out from gunshot wounds inflicted by one of his own accomplices. Elmer Wayne Henley in his case, there were no legal proceedings since his case was discovered post-mortem. All of the details in the police records were revealed by Henley, other accomplices, and the family members of past victims. Coral was so good at concealing his true nature throughout his life that he remains a mysterious figure to this day. Although Dean Correll was never captured alive and never diagnosed with any mental illness or known conditions, some of his actions seem to indicate the characteristics of a dissociative identity disorder. For example, when he was around his family, army friends, or in any other conventional social situation, he appeared normal and well-adjusted, which means he took some effort to conceal the other side of him around them. Around his right-hand men, meaning his known accomplices and his criminal associates, he could show the crazy and violent side of his personality, and did so frequently, and often enough to disturb even other hardened criminals. The media A2003 film named Freak Out was loosely inspired by the Houston mass murders committed by Coral. The film was directed by Brad Jones, who also starred as Coral. This film largely focuses upon the last night of Coral's life prior to Henley shooting him and contacting authorities. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. All right, let's dive back into the video. Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, was born on February 29, 1960, in El Paso, Texas. His dad was abusive and struggled with alcoholism, making home life terrifying for Richard, his mom, and siblings. Sadly, Richard was influenced by his older cousin Miguel Mike Ramirez, 
who was a war hero but also had a troubling past as a serial killer and rapist during his time in Vietnam. Miguel used to show the young Richard Polaroid pictures of the multiple Vietnamese women who were his own targets. These graphic images of war crimes showed the women to be raped, dismembered, and murdered. Richard was fascinated rather than repulsed. Subsequently, his own highly publicized home invasion and murder spree across the greater Los Angeles area and later the San Francisco Bay Area over the course of 14 months featured a wide variety of weapons and different murder methods. These included handguns, various types of knives, a machete, a tire iron, and a claw hammer. Richard Ramirez was known to attack by punching, pistol whipping, and strangling many of his victims, both manually with his hands and in one instance a ligature. He stomped at least one victim to death in her sleep and tortured another victim by shocking her with a live electrical cord. Ramirez apparently enjoyed degrading and humiliating his victims, especially those who survived his attacks or whom he explicitly decided not to kill by forcing them to say that they loved Satan, or telling them to swear on Satan if they wanted to live. It was during this period of intense terror that he inflicted on California residential communities that he became known as the Night Stalker in the national press. And on August 30th, 1985, Ramirez was recognized by members of the public as El Matador, or literally the killer, due to his prominence in news media reporting. A crowd of people chased him down in the street near Boyle Heights in L.A. and nearly beat him to death before police arrived. In 1989, Ramirez was convicted of 13 counts of murder, 5 attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries and sentenced to death in California's gas chamber. After filing multiple appeals, Ramirez was transferred for medical treatment of complications secondary to B-cell lymphoma to Marin General Hospital in Green Bay, California. He died there in 2013 without ever expressing any remorse for his actions. Psych profile psychiatrist Michael H. Stone describes Ramirez as a made psychopath as opposed to a born psychopath. This implies that the abuse and bad experiences he was subjected to at an early age and the unstable way he was raised led him to think that certain actions were normal, as that was the only norm he knew of. However, with the loss of his moral compass, Ramirez began to build up his own desire with the patterns of his killing and this new public spotlight he never had before as he was being portrayed as a terrifying, anonymous celebrity predator. Actually encouraged him to execute more people as a means of gaining more attention. Media Richard Ramirez has been portrayed many times in the mass media due to the intensely scrutinized nature of his case. There are many movies and documentaries about him, including two depictions of him in the most recently. There was a 2021 documentary released by Netflix called Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer, which features first-person interviews, archival footage, newly shot reenactments, and original photography related to the case. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Before we continue, 90% of you haven't subscribed to our channel, so if you like this video, please subscribe. It motivates us to make more content for you. Okay, let's continue. H. Holmes, the torture Dr. Herman Webster Mudgett, better known as Dr. Henry Howard Holmes or H. Holmes, was born on May 16, 1861, in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. He came from a modest farming family who were descendants of the original English immigrants to the area and also happened to be devout Methodists. As a young man, Mudgett trained as a surgeon from the University of Michigan. So how did this man end up becoming known as America's first serial killer? Due to unreliable reporting and an era of great superstition, there was a lot of sensationalization and misinformation about this case for decades. Initially, reports by the Yellow Press, the supermarket tabloids of the time, often emphasized the existence of Holmes' murder castle, which was supposed to contain secret torture chambers, trap doors, and a gas chambers and a basement crematorium, but all of this was subsequently disproved. Holmes did have a history of selling cadavers to medical schools. However, he acquired his wares through grave robbing rather than murder. Other accounts claim that the building was made up of over a hundred rooms and laid out like a maze, with doors opening into brick walls, windowless rooms and dead-end staircases. In reality, the hotel floor was moderately sized and largely unremarkable. It did contain some hidden rooms, but they were used for hiding furniture that Holmes bought on credit and did not intend to pay for. The verifiable facts are that Holmes was sentenced to death for only one murder, that of his former accomplice and business partner, Ben 
Benjamin Peitzel. It is believed that he killed three of Benjamin Peitzel's children as well as three women he was engaged in sexual relationships with, the child of one of the said mistresses and the sister of another. Unlike most other serial killers, Holmes usually had a rational motive for his series of murders, usually for financial reasons or to prevent his own exposure and punishment. The grisly details along the way are what really elevates this case to the top tier of the annals of American horror. He apparently used a range of methods using poison, chloroform, gas, and suspected bludgeoning. He hid the bodies pretty cleverly in cellars and backyards. He constructed elaborate and overly emotional cover stories to dupe his unsuspecting victims. Several of his endeavors were actually financial fraud and misdemeanor crimes. So as a talented con man and grifter, he himself was able to confuse the details of his exact crimes thoroughly. Historians now say that it was his own talent for tall tales, deception, and duplicity that led to his public reputation as America's first serial killer. On the other hand, he really did use some killing methods known only to medical professionals of the time. So the other title of the torture doctor is perhaps more appropriate for him. Holmes was executed in 1896. Before he died, he succeeded in thoroughly confusing the police, press, and public with wild and contradictory confessions of his own crimes. In some cases, he confessed to the murder of people who were verifiably still alive. At one point, he claimed to be possessed by Satan, which makes about as much sense as anything else that we know about him. Although this case largely predates the introduction of mental health evaluations into the United States criminal justice system, later generations of psychiatrists believe that Holmes may have been almost entirely unique in that he was psychopathic, extremely intelligent, charismatic enough to fool most others, creative in his various MOs, and prolific in his killing strategies. A study from Concordia University, St. Paul, he posits that Holmes was a predator who viewed others as a means to his ends. His personality structure resembled that of a true psychopath, a remorseless and narcissistic person who controls others and lies repeatedly. All of this while being glib and charming. Media There have been multiple books and depictions of Holmes in popular media across the last century. A few of the most famous are the 2006 episode of the U.S. television drama series Supernatural, where the ghost of H.H. H. Holmes returns to kidnap people. In 2017, the History Channel aired an eight-episode limited doka series entitled American Ripper, in which Holmes Gria Jeff Mudgett, along with former CIA analyst that Holmes was also the infamous London serial killer Jack the Ripper. And as of 2019, an adaptation of Holmes' life called The Devil in the White City, with Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio attached as executive producers, was said to be in development with Paramount TV and Hulu. This production appears to be in hiatus for now, but may well be revived later according to industry reports. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Ed Gain the butcher of Plainfield Edward Theodore Gain was born on August 27, 1906 in La Crosse, Wisconsin. His father was an alcoholic and largely unemployed, while his mother was a bitter and bigoted religious fanatic. In between the drinking and the excessive Bible reading, Gain may have ended up with what a child psychiatrist today might call trauma triggers or PTSD. Later in life, he became obsessed with accounts of cannibals and Nazis in Pulp Fiction magazines showing a tendency to enjoy a very specific kind of violence. His heavy emotional attachment to his mother may have badly affected his social development and even caused him to murder his own brother Henry, which was later referred to by his biographers as the Cain and Abel aspect of his case. After his mother's death, his mental instability spiraled. His other crimes included the murder and grave robbing of middle-aged women, who resembled his mother as his intention was apparently to create some kind of a woman's suit so he could crawl into the skin of these women and become his own mother resurrected. A police search of his home after his capture, following a particularly brutal murder, that of a neighboring female of around the right age, revealed among other evidence a disturbing diagram of the human adult female as a deceased work in progress. The evidence included whole human bones and fragments, a wastebasket made of human skin, human skin covering several chair seats, skulls on his bedposts, some female skulls with the top sawn off, bowls made from human skulls, a corset made from a female torso, skinned from shoulders to waist. 
leggings made from human leg skin and masks made from the skin of female heads. Gain apparently made a great deal of headway in constructing either a new woman, Frankenstein assembly style, or reconstructing his dead mother before he was captured. Gain could not stand trial due to his clear mental incompetence and was instead confined to a mental health facility. Later on, he was judged competent to stand trial, where he was found guilty of murder, but also pronounced legally insane and consequently remanded to a psychiatric institution. He died at Mendota Mental Health Institute in 1984. Psych profile gain was diagnosed as having been a schizophrenic as well as a sexual psychopath. His mental illness stemmed from his love-hate relationship towards women, which later turned into a full-scale psychosis. Gain was a necrophiliac as body parts excited him sexually, though he denied ever actually having sex with the dead bodies that he murdered or exhumed from graveyards on the grounds that they smelled too bad. Media Gain is actually the most famous serial killer on this list, though not necessarily under his own name. Due to the very specific and darkly grotesque nature of his crimes, Gain was the inspiration for several fictional serial killers, including Norman Bates, the killer from the movie Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock, Leatherface, a skin-wearing killer from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Jamie Gum, a.k.a. Buffalo Bill, a serial killer in The Silence of the Lambs. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Eileen Warnos Monster Eileen Lee Carol Warnos was born February 29, 1956 in Rochester, Michigan. Her father was a convicted child molester who later killed himself in prison. Warnos mother abandoned her and her brother when they were young leaving them with her parents. Warno's grandparents and their children. Warno's grandfather beat her, and her grandmother was an alcoholic. Eileen Warno's became a teenage runaway, a prostitute, pickpocket, and regular thief from pawn shops. Later on as an adult, her record included, among other felonies and misdemeanors, arrests for illegal possession of a firearm, forgery, assault, and robbery. Her associates and law enforcement personnel would often describe her as erratic and easily her arrest records frequently noted that her attitude was poor. From late 1989 through late 1990, the bodies of seven middle-aged white men were discovered in Central Florida. Eileen Warnos had robbed all of the victims before shooting them to death and stealing their cars. Of all the other serial killers on this list, Eileen Warnos is verifiably the most consistent, effective, and deadly killer of the group. As far as we know, she never left any survivors. Her victims were all of the same specific age and ethnic grouping in roughly the same area or highway territory. And the MO or modus operandi that she used was so similar in every case that as of today, Warnos is considered a textbook case of a classic serial killer, repeating her murders with regular and pinpoint accuracy. Her victims included Richard Mallory, who was shot multiple times in the chest. David Spears, who was shot six times in the torso. Charles Karskaden, who was shot nine times in the chest and stomach. Troy Burris, who died of two gunshots to the torso. Charles Dick Humphreys, who suffered multiple gunshots to the head and torso. Walter Antonio, who was shot four times in the back and head. In an interesting side note, the FBI profiler Robert K. Wrestler briefly mentioned Eileen Warnos and his autobiographical history of his 20 years with the FBI. Writing in 1992, he said he often does not discuss female serial killers because they tend to kill in sprees instead of in a sequential fashion. He said Warnos was the sole exception known to him at the time. Her methods were successful enough that she might have evaded capture indefinitely if her girlfriend Tyria Moore hadn't snitched on Warnos to the FBI to avoid her own criminal charges on complicity in the murders. Eileen Warnos was executed in 2002 in Florida after 12 years of imprisonment on death row. Psych profile according to the psychopath checklist, Warnos was found to have a strongly psychopathic personality with a score of 32. The cutoff score for psychopath is 30 out of 40 in the United States. Warnos was also diagnosed with other issues in prison and it was officially determined that she had both borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. As America's most famous female serial killer, Warnos is a celebrity in her own right and was intensively discussed and represented in the media. But her biggest moment in the spotlight came when she was portrayed by the South African origin Hollywood star Charlize Theron in The Movie Monster, released in 2003. 
Warnos was reportedly disgusted with what she saw as her exploitation by the media without her permission, though she could hardly claim any copyright violation of her crimes against humanity. Theron, on the other hand, went on to win the Oscar for Best Actress for her stellar performance. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Thug Baram, Yellow Hanker Chief Serial Killer, the darkest and quietest hour of India's late 18th century nights became the deadliest nightmare for people. Many knew that travelers who were on the roads during the night disappeared without a trace. But unfortunately, no one was sure what had happened to them. That fear drove travelers to stick together, seeking safety. But that was precisely what the thugs wanted. And no one knows how many people met their end this way. This is the story of the Yellow Handkerchief serial killer. Tracing back to the historic roots of serial homicide, roughly between the mid-1600s and the mid-1800s, travelers in India had an unshakable fear. Roads were unsafe, and the coits reigned supreme across the main provinces of the subcontinent at that time. The poor reputation of the unsafe roads were a driving force in creating an atmosphere of horror and fear among the people for centuries. It was during this time when a shy and silent kid, born in 1765, would turn into one of the biggest threats to the common people in 18th century India, and his name was Baram. A 25-year-old gangster named Saeed Amir Ali had met Baram at some point in his life and trained the kid to become a thug. Baram started to attack and murder people when he was just 10. By the time he himself was 25, he had engaged himself in the world of robberies and assassinations. Barham eventually became the leader of the gangs that murdered and looted the travelers on the roads across the subcontinent. They were a gang of over 200 thugs who worshipped Kali, the Hindu goddess of death. Barham and his companions felt that they had to make sacrifices to please their goddess so that they could prevent the world from being destroyed. Years in the life of crime made Baram and the gang pretty clever in their work. These men would resemble the physical appearance of the traveler, wearing turbans and carrying some luggage. And their idea was to loot a lot without getting caught. Sometimes the gang even used poison that would induce drowsiness, making it easy for them to loot their victims. While they were there in the jungle before attacking the men on the roads, the gang members would communicate by imitating the jackal's cry. They also kept different code languages, including a word called Ramos, which they used before assaulting their victims. Once they determined a person to loot, these men divided themselves into three groups. One group would hold the victim's feet down, another group would hold the head down, and the third would do the final murdering. Finally, they would wrap a cloth around the victim's neck and strangle him to death. Now we mention the victims as a he in particular because the gang avoided murdering women and children. After all, it was a sacrifice to their deity who was a goddess. Now the moment they robbed the men they had slain, it was no longer for their goddess. It was more to fulfill Thug Baram's unquenchable thirst than for any deity or goddess. So he started to commit murders to quench his own blood thirst. But wait, how could a yellow handkerchief be the cause of death? Well, Baram was an exceptionally gifted strangler, so his weapon of choice for murdering was a yellow handkerchief. But it doesn't sound too deadly compared to a large knife or gun, does it? Maybe that's why Barham would have turned the handkerchief into a clever murder weapon. Thug Barham employed the same way of murdering his victims almost every single time. He was said to strangle his victims to death using his handkerchief and a medallion. He could throw this medallion around the victim's Adam's apple, which allowed him to strangle people with deadly force. After that, he disposed of the remains in wells he would have murdered at least 150 people in this manner. But he witnessed many more murders taking place right in front of his eyes. During his initial days of crime, Baram was also accompanied by a female thug named Dali. But later on, both were separated. Baram gave new meaning to words like brutality, thugs, and notorious. People throughout central India had heard about the disappearances that occurred regularly and eventually it attracted the attention of the British authorities. They reacted to these unexplained incidents by assigning detectives to find out what was happening. Of course, Barham murdered these detectives, but not before they discovered that a guy named Thug Barham existed. The British didn't expect to find the detectives dead, 
And so the British sent a man into India who entirely changed the face of gangsterism in the nation. This man is almost single-handedly responsible for curbing organized crime in 18th century British India. He announced that any thug who agreed to be an informant for them would have been granted immunity. When authorities met people and informed them about this immunity, Sleeman had got a lead about said Amir Ali's location. Finally, the Britishers reached his house, but by then said had escaped from there. But his mother and other family members were arrested by the Britishers promptly. For the sake of his family, in 1832, said Amir Ali surrendered, and after many inquiries, he gave clear information about Barham to the Britishers. After a couple of years, Barham and his gang were finally captured in 1838. After the arrest, Barham revealed that he, along with his group members, had killed nearly help of yellow handkerchiefs and medallions, of which Barham personally murdered 150. After narrating the stories of his crimes, the other members of his group were also arrested by the Britishers. Finally, in 1838, he was hung at a tree at Jabalpur, Madhya Pradesh. Sleeman gave a concession to Barham's new gang members by sending all of them to the Jabalpur's reformatory. People in central India were so relieved by what transpired afterward that they named a town near Jabalpur after Sleeman, named Sleemanbad. Simply put, Thug Barham's and his people's narrative is yet another tale of human sacrifice taken to an extreme. All in the name of religion, Badham was the leader of the thuggy cult, which has its name in the Guinness Book of World Records for its 931 victims. And arrestingly, all of the gold, silver, and precious stones he stole and buried have not been recovered yet. The location of his priceless loot remains a mystery. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. All right, let's dive back into the video. Raman Raghav, India's Jack the Ripper. Mumbai, also known as Bombay, was the city that never sleeps, but it had once been put to bed early. The slum dwellers and people who didn't hesitate to sleep on the pavement were once made to go into hiding. Bombay police, who captured the underworld by the throat, once fell short of hands to piece this puzzle together. All because there was once a mystified man from Terranal Valley, Tamil Nadu, who had served five years in prison for assaulting his sister and stabbing her to death. The man had become a nightmare for people who inhabited the land of dreams and hopes. This is the story of India's Jack the Ripper. Some call him Cindy Dalway, while a few call him Talway. For some, he was Anna, and for the rest, he was Velaswamy. Was Raghav Raman. He was born in 1929 in the Tarunal Valley district of Tamil Nadu. He didn't complete his schooling because of indulging in crimes at a young age. However, his crimes didn't stop there. He assaulted his sister and stabbed her to death with multiple knife wounds, for which he served five years in prison. After that, nobody knew where Raghav went or where he lived, until he set foot in Bombay. To know his entire story, we need to go back to the times when Mumbai was Bombay. Holding an umbrella in the streets to protect himself from the unpredictable Bombay rains, a well-groomed man with neatly combed hair spreading the faint fragrance of coconut oil appeared a bit obsessive by looking into the mirror that he carried every few minutes. But except for these appearances, Raghav wasn't an ordinary man in Bombay. It happened during the late 60s. The delicate bright mornings in Bombay made people notice the dead bodies that had started piling up in their vicinities. But nobody knew how. It was evident that dwellers near slums, pavement residents, stray animals, or anybody without a suitable home were the potential targets. But no one knew that Raghav did this or that he even existed. Only in the silence of the nights, when the streetlights and suspicions were low, Raghav would come out from the woods to look for anything that moved, so that he would hammer the life out of them. To him, humans weren't humans. They were things that he could smash and crush with blunt objects. He used a regular steel rod to beat human faces, crack their heads, and break their skulls. 
He also used various handmade weapons to assault as many as 19 people along the central railway line between 1965 and 1966. Some were beaten to death, but others lived to tell the terrifying story of a small, statured guy. One such eyewitness who reported the incident to the local police was Kritika. She was a relative of one of the victims. She was the one who gave descriptions of the man who beat his victims to death. And Raghav seemed to be a homeless guy who matched the eyewitness's description. So he was summoned. But owing to a lack of proof, Raghav was deported back to the streets. After that, he wasn't suspected. His murder stopped for a while, but the peace was temporary. When the dead began to pile up again in 1968, the investigators were at a loss for how to put this puzzle together. This time, the displeasure of this unknown murderer was felt by more than a dozen victims. Owing to that, Bombay residents were again placed under lockdown. Rumors began to circulate regarding the serial killer's superhuman abilities, and the nightlife of Bombay was overwhelmed with fear. Around the same time, the case was handed over to the Deputy Commissioner of Police, Ramakant Kulkarni. Ramakant, like the rest of the police department, was confused as he went through the files. Nobody knew where to start or where to conclude their hunt. Therefore, it was impractical and nearly impossible to conduct a citywide search because no one knew who they were searching for. So the citywide search was ruled out. While hunting for leads, DCP Kulkarni began documenting the locations of the murders. They found a followed pattern similar to the 1965 to 1966 homicides. The victims were frequently hacked to death near the jungle shadows. And before 1965, it was along the central railway line near the eastern suburbs. And during 1968, it was in the northern suburbs. This remark attracted Kulkarni's interest, and he began looking through Raghav's papers, suspecting Raghav of being involved in the series of murders. Kulkarni issued a warning to his force to keep an eye out for Raghav and bring him in for interrogation. Subinspector Alex Filo was one among the cops who were called in and given Raghav's files and records. Neither cops nor the victims believed that this man would put an end to the cold-blooded of India's Jack the Ripper. A police manhunt involving 2,000 officers was underway around the city. Every member of the task team was handed a photo of Raghav. They conducted an intense hunt in every nook and corner of the city. His photograph was published in the press and a request for assistance and information. It was a gigantic mission in a massive metropolis, and locating and that's precisely what he did. When Valaljo was waiting at a bus stop in South Bombay, he noticed a person was carrying a wet umbrella. But it was not raining there, which raised the suspicions of the sub-inspector. Valaljo didn't know what made him look at the individual, but he found this man in khaki shorts and a long blue shirt walking in his direction. He asked the man where he was coming from and he replied, place in the western suburbs where the murders had happened. It strengthened his doubt since the man was walking in the wrong direction from that place. The man was also carrying half-rimmed spectacles and a thimble that resembled a particular tailor who was murdered in Malad a couple of days ago. The sub-inspector put the puzzles together and finally... Philo arrested Raghav in front of a handful of credible witnesses. Raghav's things comprised commonplace objects, including spectacles, two combs, a pair of scissors, a stand for lighting incense, soap, garlic, tea dust, and two pieces of paper with mathematical figures. His clothing was bloodstained, and his fingerprints matched those on the dead victims. Finally, Raman Raghav was convicted. The police were able to put a face to the 40-plus murders for the first time. Raman's story, however, did not finish there. His confession was as mysterious as the murders that he had carried out. Raman refused to answer any questions for weeks following his arrest. His lips were locked regardless of whether he was being beaten or punished. Out of all the tactics in the book, a chicken dish was the one that made Raman talk. He asked the cops for having the chicken curry after his arrest. After weeks of questioning, the cops decided to agree with his request. After completing his entire chicken curry meal, Raman told the police to ask him whatever questions they wanted. Before the cops knew all they wanted, they had to fulfill a few more wishes, though. But finally, Raghav admitted to murdering 41 people. Following his confession, he accompanied the police on a citywide tour to show them the locations where he worked. 
and to retrieve the rod he had hidden in the northern suburbs. Ragov was sentenced to death for his crime, but his defense argued that he was mentally incapable of making conscious judgments and did not realize his actions were illegal. Ragov was referred to a special medical board of three psychiatrists by the Bombay High Court due to this. When a panel of doctors examined him at the directive of the High Court, they found that he would never be cured of his kidney failure as well. So the High Court reduced his sentence to life imprisonment in their judgment on August 4, 1987. He was lodged at Yerwada Central Jail in Pune. He was also under treatment at the Central Institute of Mental Health and Research. In 1995, Raghav died at Sassoon Hospital due to kidney failure. It has been decades since these incidents have happened, and yet Raman Raghav remains as India's Jack the Ripper. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Renuka Shinde and Seema Gavit, the first women in India to receive the death sentence. The story of Renuka Shinde and Seema Gavit is a famous example of how parenting can go drastically wrong. And these two sisters gave the term heartless a whole new meaning. This is the story of the first women in India to be hanged for their heinous crimes. One who puts their kids above their own selfish needs and wants. It's not a job, it's a choice. But meet Anhanyebai, who neither considered parenting a gift nor a responsibility. She was an exceptional mother who ruined the entire lifetime of her daughters, besides destroying many other kids' lives. There wouldn't have been any story about Ranuk Shinda and Seema Gavit if Anana didn't enter the play. Yes, it all began with Inhana. She had no life skills other than pickpocketing and grabbing jewelry in busy areas. It was how she managed to get by for so many years. But one day, this cold-eyed criminal was arrested for 125 petty theft cases, including pickpocketing and snatching people's gold chains from around their necks at railway stations. She said that she had become a thief only after her first husband, a truck driver, deserted her after the birth of Renuka. She then married Mohan Gavit and they had a daughter, Seema Gavit. But indeed, at a point after their marriage, Mohan became sick of having continual conflict with the cops for petty thievery because Ahna had roughly so many cases filed against her. Mohan hoped that getting Renuka married would at least make Ahna understand her responsibilities. So, in 1989, they married Renuka to Kiran Shinde, who was working as a tailor near Shiridi. But even after Renuka's marriage, Anhana didn't change. Instead, she started to ruin Renuka's life by leading her into petty crimes. Not being able to tolerate Anhana's activities in 1990, Mohan divorced her and left Sima with her. He then got married to a lady named Pratiba. Mohan knew that Anhana Hanna was extremely angered because of the marriage, but little did he know about the influence of Hanna over Renuka and Sima. What began as a revenge strategy for Mohan leaving, Hannah quickly turned it into manic kidnappings for her selfish gain. Neither Hannah nor her daughters could forget Mohan leaving them. Though Hannah did these petty crimes for her living, she couldn't let Mohan live a happy life with his wife. So, in November 1996, on Anna, along with her daughters, Renuka and Seema, planned to kidnap and murder Mohan's nine-year-old daughter, Kranti. And they succeeded in that plan. Mohan and Pratiba reported their kid's disappearance. They both were sure that only Anana and her daughters could do this to Kranti. The inspectors assigned to the investigation confirmed their suspicions as well. The search team was sent to their house in Nazik. They uncovered evidence of more kidnapping, including discarded clothing of Kranti, confirming that they had murdered her. They also found a mysterious presence of several children in photos of Renuka's children's birthday party celebrations. They didn't seem to be locals. Nasik police quickly figured out that the three women were a pickpocketing gang, also involved in petty crimes. But who were the children? The investigation of the children's identity led them to find that Kranti wasn't the only one they murdered. Chatterstringi Temple, a famous religious place in Pune, was where the actual story of Renuka Shinde and Seema Mohan Gavit took a sinister turn. And Renuka's son Sudhir was the catalyst for their initiative in these crimes. It was 1990. One day the three women went with Renuka's son Sudhir to a temple. The first time when the trio had gotten into some trouble. Besides being a kid, Sudhir had attempted to pickpocket someone, 
which turned the eyes of the crowd towards Renuka and Sudhir, but she turned her child into a shield, telling the crowd that a mother with a kid would never steal. These words from the mother made the angry crowd stay calm, and finally the crowd let them go. This incident made Anhana take a child with them whenever the group committed a robbery. Instead of Renuka's kids, they chose newborns and young children from busy areas like temples or marketplaces. Then, when they finished their thefts, or if the infant opened its mouth and made any sound, they would either leave or murder the child. Their first victim was Suntosh, who was just 18 months old. Renuka kidnapped him from a female beggar in Kohalpur. The trio took him to Kohalpur and went to a temple. When Sima tried to snatch a wallet and was caught by the male victim, he began beating her, and Hannah deliberately threw Santos to the ground to create a distraction. Unfortunately, the child sustained a head injury due to her monstrous acts. The crowd empathized with the kid's cry and consoled the trio, so their theft went unreported to the police. The trio then moved on to a bus stop and stole three more purses with injured Santosh. They didn't even care to offer first aid to the kid. Due to his bleeding head wound, the poor kid continued to cry. Anna decided the boy was of no further use and might attract the attention of the police. So she mercilessly struck him with an iron pole until he was dead, and then washed her clothes of blood. They took his body to a rickshaw stand and disposed of it, fleeing back to their hostel. This was only the start of their horrible actions. They kidnapped dozens of kids between 1990 and 1996, and then discarded them when they had served their purpose. The majority of them were beaten to death, their skulls smashed in, or thrown down flights of stairs, among other things. In 1991, they kidnapped nine-month-old Naresh, who was starved and beaten to death because he cried too much, while an 18-month-old Bahavna was bundled into a handbag and left in a cinema's restroom. In 1993, the trio abducted a one-year-old child named Buntai and a two-year-old girl Swati from Kalyan Railway Station in Mumbai and a two-year-old boy, Gudu, from another Mumbai station. Three women murdered Bunti and Guru and disposed of their bodies. In 1994, they kidnapped another two-year-old kid named Anjali and Nashik. They murdered her and disposed of the body. Kiran, Renuka Shinde's husband, had no other choice than to help the trio dispose of the body. In 1995, they kidnapped a boy named Raja from a bus stop in Kohalpur and murdered him as well. They kidnapped Pankaj Mamankar, age four. When they found that the boy was talking to the passers-by about his parents, the ladies killed him by hanging him upside down from a ceiling and slamming his skull against a wall. That was in 1996. According to Kerwin Shinde, these ladies were ruthless and had no guilt for their actions. And authorities linked the photographs to the slew of kidnappings and murders, involving children in Koholpur, Nashik and Poon districts to the trio of the sisters and their mother. All of them, including Kiran Shinde, were arrested. Despite this, Kiran received a pardon in exchange for collaborating with the authorities and providing all of the information they needed. Sima Govind was just 25 and Renuka Shinde was 29 during their arrest in 1996. While Anana died of sickness shortly after her arrest, the court the other two were found guilty of murdering five children and abducting 13 children. Despite filing a mercy petition in 2014, which India's former president Pranab Mukherjee denied, the sisters are presently on execution row. In reviewing the mercy appeal brought by half-sisters, the Bombay High Court postponed its judgment on December 23, 2021. Bombay High Court commuted the half-sisters' execution sentence to life imprisonment on January 18, 2022. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. K.D. Kapama India's first convicted female serial killer. Over a time period of three months, five women were discovered dead on the outskirts of Bangalore. There were no marks on their bodies and no sexual or physical violence evidence. Cops were confused until the autopsy entered the play. According to the victim's autopsy report, cyanide was in their system. Who do you suspect committed these assassinations? What may be the reason behind this? Most people imagine a male with wrong reasons as the murderer of these women. But you would be wrong. Yes, this is the story of India's first convicted female serial killer. The mastermind behind the cyanide was K.D. Kepama, 
also known as Cyanide Malika. Here's the story of how she got her name, female serial killer. She is accused of being responsible for the deaths of six women in the state of Karnataka between 1998 and 2007. After her first murder, she is thought to have taken a seven-year sabbatical. The fact that a woman murdered these victims astonished the investigating authorities for a long time, thanks to chauvinistic mentalities. This isn't a scary story by any means. Actually, on the contrary, this is a narrative of greed and ambition. It is the story of a humble lady who was so ambitious that nothing could stand in her way, not even human lives. Born in 1970, Kigali Purakepama and her family lived in the suburbs of Bangalore. They were a simple family leading an everyday life like most other families in the village. Kepama was always ambitious. She had always been attracted to a more lavish lifestyle. She always thought of pursuing the quickest path to her goals. Her ambitions never changed even after she grew. When she was a teenager, Kepama married a tailor and became a mother soon after. She had two more children after that. However, Kepama was dissatisfied with life's offerings. She wanted more and much more. She served as a house helper in the place that she was born. Yet her earnings didn't satisfy her. So, Kepama decided to become wealthy overnight and began stealing from the homes where she worked as a helper. Following this, she decided to establish a chit fund near her house to assist her in achieving her objectives, which she finally accomplished. However, as a result, the chit funds experienced significant losses because of Kepama. This resulted in the family of five being buried in debt. Kepama's husband threw her out of the house in a rage. In 1998, he deserted her. She was forced to search for new sources to create money after losing her business. While she was looking for a source of money, she found cheating ladies in distress to be the easiest. She eventually found work at a jewel shop after working as a helper for a period of time. However, it too did not work out in the end. Her employment at the jewel shop, on the other hand, was not in vain. She also had discovered a one-way ticket to wealth in the shape of cyanide. Kepama claims that she learned about cyanide and its usage as a poison from the movies that she viewed. However, while cyanide was a copied notion, the remainder of the method was unique. So Kepama came up with a great murderous plan to get wealthy in only a few days. And her plan was to capture ladies visiting the temple. Every day, Kepayame would visit the temple to keep a closer eye on what was there. She remained focused on the regulars, who appeared to be in a lot of discomfort. When the timing was perfect, she would approach them as holy women and listen to their troubles. She would be well aware of their distress and desires. She would say that she decided to help them out by performing a ritual which would fix all of their issues. She would also ask them to wear the most valuable clothes and jewelry to the ritual. Gampama would frequently invite them to a temple on the outskirts of town that they had never visited before. After that, she'd ask them to close their eyes and pray. They had no clue that it would be their final blink of the eye. Then she'd bring them holy water, which was cyanide-laced water, and that was her modus operandi for all of her victims. Sainid Malika's first victim was a 30-year-old rich woman, Mamata Rajan, living on the outskirts of Bengaluru in 1999. After that, Kepama's attention was pulled to precious goods regularly. In the month of October 2007, Elizabeth became her second victim. Elizabeth was a woman who was on the search for her missing granddaughter. Kepama called her to Kabbalama Temple, performed her ritual and murdered her. Her third victim was 60-year-old Yashad Ama, who suffered from asthma. In December of 2007, with the promise of curing the same, Kep Ama brought her to Sitaganga and murdered her. Muniyama was Kep Ama's fourth target, who wished to be a devotional singer. Unfortunately, she was murdered at a temple in Yadair, a short distance from Bangalore. Kep Ama's fifth victim, Yashad Ama, was killed in a car accident. Palama was a priest at a temple in Hebel. Kabama promised her that she would sponsor the building of a new arch for the temple and murdered Palama at a temple close to Manja. The sixth and final victim of Sainid Malika was a poor, childless woman who only wanted a son. Her name was Nagveni and she was murdered in her sleep. Kabama was caught and arrested on December 31, 2008. 
at a bus stop in an attempt to sell the jewelry that she had taken off of her victims. Unfortunately, many other jewels belonging to her other victims were also found. She was eventually given the death penalty for her murders, which was later commuted to a life sentence. While Kepama was convicted for the cold-blooded murders of these six women, it is believed that she may have killed other women too. This might have included a young woman called Renuka, wanted to give birth to a son but could not. The profile fit Kepama's modus operandi, but this was not proven. A few other women had also gone missing, some of whose bodies were found in 2009 and further connected to Kepama. Her victims were older ladies going through difficult moments in their lives, and Kepama would take on a new identity after each murder. She was first arrested by Baidati police in 2001. She tried to rob jewelry from a house where she went to perform a ritual. Kepama was taken to the interrogation there, but the relatives found her and she was rescued. She, however, was sentenced to six months in jail for her crime. As a result, she was released after six months of imprisonment. After her first murder, Kepama was reported to have gone seven years without getting engaged in another. There are claims that she murdered many people during this period. This also remains a mystery. She admitted to her crimes when the police arrested her, but this was not the end, as Kabama was again convicted for multiple murders. She was consecutively given the death sentence in 2010 and 2012 for the murders of Miriyama and Nagvini respectively. But her punishment for Nagvini's death was commuted to a life in prison, as only circumstantial evidence was found against her. Kep Ama became the first woman to be given the death penalty in Karnataka. In 2017, Kemp Ama again hit the headlines when she became the jailmate of VK Sashikala, a confidant of late Supremo J. Jayalesha. It was alleged that Kemp Ama tried to meet Sashikala several times, due to which she was shifted to another jail, as she posed a threat to Sashikala. Malika's cyanide is still a mystery. Although we sometimes try to rationalize murders by looking back in time to identify anything that went horrifically wrong during the killer's formative years, Sainad Malika's early life provides no such clues, as there is little to no information about that period. The circumstances surrounding the killings, on the other hand, lead us to think that she was motivated entirely by financial gain. However, Sainad Malika remains to be India's first convicted female serial killer. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue.